try to turn on some lights. So hello everyone, uh, welcome to the Q and evening Q&A. Uh, I'm very impressed actually that we have 97 uh, people already live and uh, look, listening to us uh, and primarily of course to Danielle and uh, also the people who are asking questions I hope are online so that uh, they can actually ask that question in person. We have now a format uh, where we have an hour for I think a more chatty kind of conversation and no one like the questioner can actually um, do as well as uh, in, ans in asking those questions. So um, I have five questions in the Q&A. Um, also, everyone feel free to add votes uh, uh, so that I can, if, I, if, if there are many questions in the, in the coming in that I can prioritize. I will just go from the top right now and um, the uh, question, oh, that was from Neurostar, so that's why. Um, see whether uh, Zimo Slavinsky is online and I can ask his question in person. So actually, these are all Neurostar questions um, at this point. Um, let's see. Yes, he's, I will ask him on screen. So, hi, Thomas. Um, Thomas is our program director and is really responsible for most of the program. So, thanks so much for your hard work. And I have invited Zima Witzowinski to join us to ask his question, but at this point, he's not coming on screen. Um, <coughs> And if folks want to ask new questions, then I know for sure that they're on uh, that they're available right now, and um, we'll go for that. Um, so yes, please ask new questions uh, because I do not find the other questioners on screen. So let's just read the one question uh, and do it without the questioner being present that we have had left over from uh, from this morning. Uh, and that question was that the uh, model anatomy uh, uh, similarly directed information um, and that DI describes the causality effect effect between two time series. And here you used for explaining the information flow among world sensors agents. Uh, do you have a feedback information measure e.g. between sensors and memory uh, or bidirectional information measure in your approach? Um, this is the question by Xiang Li? That's right. Xiang Li, okay. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I fully understand it, but essentially you can of course use always directed information. Um, the, the way we used empowerment was actually quite straightforward. It has no feedback. Okay, so basically, in the moment you know your state, from that moment on, you have a ba basically blind, blind operation of actions and see what happens. So you're throwing stones around and see whether they hit actually a, a, a glass house. Okay, yeah, you throw the stone and then do whatever you want, and then there's a result. Um, of course, uh, doing feedback probably will involve uh, directed information. It's just harder to do, and you get a surprisingly far without doing it. Okay, so so that's that's one thing. Um, of course, there are situations you will need feedback, in which case uh, we will have to do directed information. That's one part of the question. I'm having a second look at the at the question and see whether I understand what it means. Um, um, yeah, and now. 
there is no no reason not to use this measure elsewhere you see the interesting part about the whole information theory is that nobody tells you who should be the agent and who should be the world so it's perfectly okay to treat one part of the brain as the agent other part as from that perspective from that perspective as a uh, as a world so you could treat parts of the brain as senders or not just senders but actuators and others as, as, as agents and others as as the world that's perfectly possible and everything we talked about you can do on every level so you can look at an individual neuron as an agent and its environment as a world you can look at the whole agent you can look at parts of the brain so this is one thing one beauty of the information theoretic approach it is quite universal the only question that remains is how do you choose who's the agent and who's the world what are natural boundaries that you would impose because i think the whole approach makes best sense if you choose good well well separated entities okay so and, and an entity where you would expect an evolutionary normative you could call it normative pressure to to maximize say empowerment or something like that so there are reasons to assume that there are some entities where you don't care about real empowerment because they just have to do a job right um, if you have a bone the bone has to be stable that's it but but it's not supposed to do anything so you should ask yourself where would it make sense for the system to maximize its uh it's it's um it's empowerment so you th there's always an evolutionary empowerment many people have tried to argue and argue for empowerment like what it is like causal tropic forcing from physical reasons but i'm let's put it this way i'm very adamant i i don't i don't see a physical reason perhaps there is one but i don't see it but an evolutionary reason i can give you immediately so empowerment from an evolutionary point of view, it's very clear. An organism that has actuators that do influence the world without the sensors picking it up or have sensors that see the world where anything you do doesn't change the sensors. That's not a worthwhile perception actual loop to have. You want sensors because you want to react on them. And you want to react on them because you can actually do something that changes the sensors. Otherwise, there's no point. In other words, you want an impedance match. An informational impedance match between what you do and what you can sense. It's not always perfect. And this mismatch is what makes it interesting. That's a different story. I will probably talk about that a little bit in the workshop on information theory. But this, there's a mismatch. But you want it to be as good as possible. Okay? So when that makes sense, we believe empowerment may be a plausible optimization uh, criterion for biological systems. Okay, um, were you already reacting to the question in the chat that uh, just uh, Simowit asked us? Is... Yes. So essentially, yes. Um, so basically, the question is: um, if would it could it use it as objective function in ultra encoder to maximize the environment? Yes, definitely yes. Um, I don't know whether it makes sense. It's something that needs to be tried out. But basically what you're saying is when you maximize empowerment, you maximize your readiness for whatever can impinge you, okay? You, 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 you know, uh, the famous um, uh, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts motto, um, be prepared. That's what empowerment does. It prepares you for what may happen. Yeah, it is not useful if you know what you're going to do is you know what the goal is then you just optimize the goal it prepares you however if you don't know the goal the goal is unclear you don't have a goal uh, it may still be decided all these things are criteria that may may be relevant for saying okay i want to be empowered because i have no idea what to have what to do there's one joke that i always say um, uh, tactics is what you do when you know what to do, and strategy is what you do when you have no idea what to do. And that's why politicians and CEOs always talk about strategy, because they have no idea what to do. 
Empowerment is strategy, right? So if you don't know how the future looks like, you put yourself in a position where you have the most options. You know what the future looks like. You, you just do your stuff, right? That's, that's kind of the cheap version of the, of the whole story. Okay, the next question will come from Fat Yasin, and I will um, try and call him up on screen. You're welcome. So I think one has to be a little bit patient with uh, Crowdcast when it comes to inviting folks on screen. It... Yeah, the light has to travel through Pluto and this band. Right. Like that, <laughs> Something like that. Well, it has to go back through all the servers that try to mine our private data and whatever comes next. So... Yeah, they will dig out all the secrets we exchange here. OK, here's Fah. So please go ahead and, and ask your question. My question is, am I audible? There's noise somewhere. So my question is uh, very specific to some uh, human condition. Suppose an agent, a uh, human agent, watches a lot of videos from YouTube uh, regarding uh, success of other people, say CEOs or politicians or celebrities. So I am am... a little bit uh, more slowly. The connection is not very good. A little bit okay. louder. Right? Okay. I think the voice goes on with it. Sure. So uh, suppose that an agent, a human agent, watches a lot of videos in YouTube of videos of success videos of other CEOs, celebrities, politicians, and other people. So he's having, he or she's having that perceptual inference that this is possible. But because of our empathy system, we are empathizing their success with ourselves, but not necessarily the active inference that I have the potential to do that. I got the result. I, felt the results at least second hand that this can be happened, but not necessarily because of my capabilities. So that's what I uh, like meant by when I say I have, what do you do when you have all the information, but you don't act it out? Does that increase the you know, entropy or uncertainty more in my brain or how does that work? Okay, I'll answer in two, in two, in two rounds, okay? Yeah. Um, why are we so enthralled by, um, there's some noise um, somewhere in the background. Yes, I just, sure. muted, I just muted him so that uh, that we can get a clear answer. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, there's so many so many options for for intru intru in, uh, intrusion. Okay, so I'll answer in two two spaces. So having the knowledge, let's start first thing with having the knowledge, is expensive, of course. If you know all these things, you can do all these things. You are trained in doing. Uh, all these difficult things, of course, it takes space in your brain, right? I mean, there's certainly some compression, there's certainly some some optimization, overlapping experiences. So, for example, if you're very good at archery, you might be reasonably good uh, or uh, having some advantage in learning how to uh, throw spares, things like that, right? So there may be some overlap in, in skill. Now, if you look at these... Um, why, why, why do we lo like to s watch all these celebrities or the successful people, or James Bond, who's really doing these absolutely impossible stunts, um, and successfully so? Why do we like this? We, we don't show all the times that people have tried that and failed, right? We sh show only the successes. Now, here's my theory, and um, I I'll tell you a little story from my own, from my own stock, um, because that... that that's a story I, I, I had myself. When I was a kid, um, I was actually uh, at school and I was sitting, it was before class and it was a sloping room and I had this paper ball, basically this butter bread paper in my hand and I wanted to get rid of it and it was before class so I threw it to the trash can but it was clear it would not hit the trash can. The trash can was far away, it was under the sink, it was unreachable and it was very clear I would throw and then get up and put it back properly in, right? You know, nice kid. I'm not. I'm not a troublemaker. Now, the interesting part was, the paper fell just between sink and wall, bumped two, three times back and forth, and fell into the trash can. So basically, the most absolute impossible throw, totally impossible. 
It was really whatever Luke Skywalker did on Death Star, I did in my own little way with this paper ball. Now, the, the guy beside me saw that and thought, oh my God, did you do it on purpose? Was, of course, well, right, whatever. I didn't say anything, but I just, just showed this of course face. But what is interesting is the following. What it showed, this is possible. So if I now wanted to refine the skill and practice three hours a day to make these throws reliable and repeat them, and so that I can make this throw with a high reliability again and again and again, suddenly my empowerment has gone up, right? So the throw, my model of the throw says, no, you can't do it. It's impossible to succeed. My empowerment, however, grows as I can refine and, and channel this action in a way that this throw becomes possible. Now, you think this is a joke, but people do make money out of this. It's called golfing. In golfing, people do exactly that. They take this ball, shoot the ball. You know, the, the, the ball is in the bunker. You have no chance of hitting, hitting the hole. And then this Nick Faldo guy just hits the bunker. The ball goes up and and goes into the hole. No chance of believing, you don't believe it's possible. So what happens is that you discover that there is a regularity, there is a reliability of how to inject information to your actions so they get reliable or half half reliable outcomes. It's not perfect, it's not perfect, but it's, 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 it's uh, discovering that this is possible. That's why we like that. In roulette, for example, this is misled. So people, that get addicted to gambling are misled somehow by the psychology of roulette to believe that they can actually control, that they actually can control the outcome of the ball. Of course they can't, we know this, this is pure luck. Um, but the point is that they are led to believe that it's controllable. So in other words, basically one of the interesting aspects of human skill as, comp as opposed to um, to, for example, uh, skills by, by equal, very, very intelligent primates, is that humans can tell each other it is possible to make things like that reliable. You can become an archer that hits a target from 300 yards. You can, you can do that, and this is reproducible if you practice. So what I'm trying to say is um, that empowerment relies not only the sensors, but relies also on your model on the of your forward model okay so if your forward model tells you and that now i'm coming back to your celebrities yes it's possible for for people like I, i'm not going to say names but just by appearing on the internet to become billionaires um okay that interests people because it, it tells them the story that if i refine my skills enough i can do that reproducibly nobody really knows what the proportion of luck is and what the proportion of skill is certainly there is skill Certainly there's luck, okay? But I, I'm not sure the, when I'm answering your question, but I, 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 the idea is a little bit, um, storing this information is expensive. Refining the model, however, is it makes a difference in empowerment. If you don't have a good forward model, you don't have empowerment. So uh, if I understood correctly, whatever information that I extract from the states of the world, all of them are in service of how I can act on the world, but the human yeah. condition, the, but the human condition posits that uh, I can kind of convince myself that anything is possible, regardless of its luck, regardless of its mability, it is possible. So I can kind of make myself act on it. It's not a regardless of luck. You can't ignore luck, right? But the point is the question: Where is where is luck? Where is luck, and where is your capability? Yeah. Yeah. And we are trying as humans, we like to in, increase our bubble of autonomy. We try to take away from Lady Luck, as they like to call it, if you personalize it, the, 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 the ability we try, like to be our own uh, in our control. It's not always possible. Sometimes we overestimate our powers. Then we think we are in control, we are not. Right? Uh, or we think that it's because we are so smart that everything works and we were just being lucky. But this is exactly what we learned, right? So so we're trying to take out of the... For example, you build a machinery and it breaks down. And what does an engineer do? Engineers are people who create 
take out the lot of the machinery working or not. Yeah, they make a machine working reliable if they're good engineers. That's exactly what they do. And if something doesn't go on our way, we'd blame it on lady luck. It's bad luck. So we'll protect that internal forward model. Well, it depends. If you want to succeed, uh, then actually blame yourself. So normally, um, being self-critical in a healthy way is distinguishing, okay, I actually did a mistake. And if I made a mistake, I can fix it. If it's bad luck, I can't fix it. Right? So that, that's, that's not always the right thing to do. Right? So, so essentially, empowerment is about finding out how far can I actually myself control my environment? And how far, okay, that's the way it is. Nothing to be done. I think that's fascinating. Uh, so now, now we come all the way to morality and uh, not should, we shouldn't blame bad luck when we don't succeed. I, I think that's very true in a lab environment where if people in an experimental uh, framework think it's bad luck that the experiment doesn't work, they don't improve their technique enough to uh, make it work better next time. So don't blame the equipment, I guess, is another way of uh, phrasing this. Um, so Thomas Nowotny had a question that got some positive vibes, so I, I'll try and pull him up on screen. It's quite surrealistic, this type of setup. I can't see anybody, and uh, but I know you're out there. <laughs> right. Uh, 95 uh, alive listeners, yes, so that would be a lot of little icons on the screen. Um, um, so I think Tom's is trying to connect. And you can always look at the question beforehand, at least the one, uh, invite is not there, okay. We need to invite him, obviously. Too many video sources. Oh, we have, uh, um, um, I guess, I think that uh, I, our previous speaker uh, didn't, I didn't actually have our previous questioner formally dismissed, uh, so he may still be there as a ghost. And we now have too many streams. Uh, so I, sorry, Anand, I will close you down for a moment. Um, yeah, so if you're called on screen uh, during this uh, uh, procedure, please wait until I close your icon because if you somehow just quit, um, you seem to be staying around and taking a channel out of the four channels that we have. So please let me close the connections. Uh, it seems to be a lesson learned here. Uh, hi, Thomas. All right. Hey, yeah, it's me again. I, um, I thought uh, I, I pushed Daniel a bit in a different direction, yeah? so uh, away, away from the empowerment only, uh, in a more general question. I. Um, I really like these probabilistic approaches, uh, you know, probability theory, information theory. But in general, if you want to kind of look at real world problems and you don't have full control of your model and you don't know every detail of it, it's really hard to get to those probability distributions to calculate anything. For example, like local information flow or so on. You really need very fine grained information about everything. And, and how do you collect the statistics? So I wonder whether it's only a theoretical tool and we should be happy with that or whether there's something you can do in practice where you can actually make it work on real world systems. Okay, I mean, um, there's a reason uh, probably why information theory became popular in the last years because it is hard to compute, it's hard to estimate. Um, in fact, uh, Shen information seems to be the nastiest of all the Renu uh, entropy quantities. So uh, there are, I think, with order two or something is much easier to compute um, and estimate. Um, so, you know, if you're not purist, you can go for a Renyu entropy and uh, take a different power and get some some results. You lose a lot of, of the nice properties, uh, the additivity and a couple of things that, um, that, that you have. However, um, first of all, I don't think that for practical purposes you always need 
a precise information measure. The imp information measure is what you want when you do theory. The information measure is what you want when you do computations um, on, on well-defined uh, systems. But in practice, sometimes it's enough to have something that has a signature of information, it's correlated with information. Now, does nature optimize information? We do not know. What I think happens is something else, is you have two systems. One uh, is optimally, informationally near optimal, the other one is not. It's clear. The first system is faster, more efficient, uses less energy, or at the same energy can do more. And that's how it becomes informationally optimal. So anything that approaches this somehow is suitable. Yeah, there are some people that actually believe that the networks, uh, in some aspects, um, compute actually information theoretical um, information theoretical quantities, um, or approach them, or implement bottlenecks. There, there are now the attempts to show that actually what they do is a series of information bottlenecks. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if that can be established, then we have a way of computing it. It doesn't have to be perfect; it has to be good enough, right? We don't believe that organisms are perfect. But they are good enough, and that that's perfectly fine. The question is really, um, what what do we do when the systems are very big? So first of all, I do not believe that biology is able to compute super complicated functions in one unit. So I don't believe that you can have you know in mathematics you write a function f and it can be arbitrarily complicated, even if it's binary. You make it very very complicated. I don't think that happens. I think um, it's the opposite. I think in, in biology, the things that come together to compute something are really very similar. They're, 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 they're basically variants of the same thing. They're, they're additions, modifications, shifts, things like that. They're, they're, you can't make an arbitrarily complicated Boolean function on, on a simple unit. So in other words, there is a limit to the complexity that you need to consider, and that changes the game. Now you can look at models, but every entity is actually quite simple and has a. Well, if you go, yeah. yeah, if you now go big in a big system, then you can still make any function, right? We know that. And yes, exactly. On very simple units, you can approximate any function, right? Exactly. And now the point is that you essentially look at your environment. That if you look at one unit, you look at its environment as some kind of typical environment, or else. You can also look at max entropy or generalization there, the generalizations there, as I don't know how my environment looks like. So if I don't know how my environment looks like, the best assumption is max entropy or max entropy under certain conditions, things like that. That's basically something you can do. And as you know more, you add this information into your model and compute that. And um, there are also, also all kinds of tricks to approximate stuff. And if you know certain things, you can put this knowledge into your system. So um, the theory is very beautiful. Um, the reality is dirty, but that's always like that. I, I guarantee you that the guys who do uh, work at CERN and try to find out the rules of the universe have beautiful formulas, but when they come and measure these, they have to compute what's the uh, cross-section of this oh. detector, whatever. Hmm. So you're suggesting, I mean, you, you don't get the exact stuff when you actually want to apply it, but it's still useful because you can do a coarse grain view on it and the structures are right, and then you can refine it whenever you get more and, and yes. you're on the right track. That's the idea, right? Basically, you come from two sides, from the theoretical um, um, the, 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 from the theoretical side, understanding what you want, making predictions also. Information theory gives us a lot of predictions. That's really cool. Um, the, I will talk a little bit more in the, uh, in the workshop uh, talk. But you can make predictions that are non-obvious, right? So they emerge by the structure of information. Say, I expect this type of phenomenon to appear. Then, they are, then, then, then there's the analysis from down, and we try to close this gap, right? But the nice thing about information theory is one language. Use the same language for the top and the low level, and as you close the gap, and sometimes you can actually link them together, you you become uh, more and more. You the know. only the only problem you get is if you you, you can get uh, you know if you're not careful, you can of course get wrong wrong uh, results, right? So you can look for causality and uh, try things like you know all this Granger and uh, transfer entropy and this and that, and you you know of all the problems, right? If you don't have the full information, 
you can see all kinds of you know, pseudo correlations and yeah. so 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 it's not all without problems right but i i see your point yeah i mean it, nothing is perfect and you, you, you can bootstrap yourself through quite nicely i'd like to comment on causality because this is something that's very important for you of course um causality is a particularly nasty question okay um in physics uh, physicists were very lucky early on that you could actually that Galilei and his, his contemporaries discovered you can separate out an experiment I have this ball and I can do stuff to this ball and pretend like nothing impinges on it it's by the way not right it's not true but you know it works well enough uh, quantum physicists had a conceptual problem for a long time before they got uh, to the concept of, of uh, of Hilbert space, and uh, it's quite difficult. People still argue about that. I, I think it's solved by now, actually. But you pack everything you want to talk about in the state. If you don't do that, you are in dire trouble. You're in dire trouble, even in quantum physics. I like to mention that because everybody looks up at physics as kind of the most mathematical, mathematizable uh, science, uh, experimental science. But no, they have a similar problem. In neural systems, you have the problem that this is like, it's worse than quantum system in a way, because everything talks to everything all the time. It's very clear you can't easily isolate. And so, each element can be different. That's the second problem, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Not like in physics. In fact, yeah. the, the being different is, is uh, seems to be a hallmark of biology, actually. Right. And uh, so... I do think that causality, if you are, try to get causality from observations only, you need to really know what you're doing, okay? So you need a good model, and I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not, it's not like you can press a button, you get that. You have to, you have to really have some extra insight, either better models or something that tells you, okay, there's a reason why I think the cause is really coming from there. And the whole um, partial information decomposition discussion, many people talk about that, but they try to make it work because actually unique information is a way to say, oh, this is information that's not affected by anything else. So it helps me track and causality. I, I think this is exactly why it's so difficult to do that. It's obviously information theory tells us, no, 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 you guys, you don't get that. You're not, don't, you're not there yet. Right. I think information theory tries to talk to us, and we don't. <laughs> yeah, like the secret messages in the in the, in the engineer chips we had in the other talk. But uh, I don't want to monopolize the discussion. So, so thank you very much, Daniel. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks, Tara. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, the next question I'll just read is from Roderick Quinn. And sorry for uh, slaughtering some people's names. Uh, it's hard to avoid sometimes. Um, so his question is very short. Uh, how would your method translate into a multi-agent environment with bad agents? Uh, oh. I guess the bad agents might be criminal folks around you, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I can answer that. I can answer that. Um, we had several years ago a paper. Um, it, it came out at the big uh, spate, uh, spate of uh, slate of, of issues on ethical robotics. And we had a suggestion to use a kind of altruistic version of empowerment um, to ha get helpful robots. I won't go into detail, it's a long story, but essentially you, in empowerment, it's very important to say who's the actor and who's the receiver. Now, if the receiver is somebody else, you can be um, altruistic. Um, so, in other words, if you, for example, uh, want to save your, uh, say you're a companion in a game, you're a player, or you're a player and there's a companion, and the uh, automatic companion empowers, tries to empower the player. So the companion automatically tries to help the player, and not in a bad way, like like in, in Asimov's, uh, Asimov's Three Laws, but actually in a nice way, because it will not deprive you of your possibilities. It will remove your enemies who try to kill you, if you're killing you is taking the ultimate empowerment away, um, but it will try to limit your enemies, set you free, help you to, to get free, free of a prison or things like that. Now, of course, there's no reason why that help needs to be um, in the positive sign. You can turn the sign around. That has been done in the context of games, actually, to create more interesting game opponents. So, um, and this has been done by Christoph Salga and uh, Christian Guckelsberger. 
and they looked actually at antagonisms, antagonistic players that try to deprive the player of empowerment. And so they get different kinds of antagonists. So depending on the uh, depending on the parameters, how, mu how much emphasize you have to your own survival, to the taking away the empowerment from the others and so on, they get results like, I call them, I give them the name, they call them differently in the paper. Um, one is the cowardly backstabber. He tries to take away your empowerment, but prioritizes its own survival. Um, then there is a psycho killer. And this is a guy that tries to kill you, whatever, doesn't care about its own safety. And the third one, they actually call that a supervillain. Um, so that one tries to harm you really bad, but he doesn't want to kill you. He pushes a player in the lava and pulls him out just when the last health point is still there and then heals him because he likes to play around with his prey. This is a result that was not programmed in. This is emergent. Okay? So I, I always told told them they should actually call the, the paper the nature of evil. But yeah, so the point is you can model this. So I, I don't know whether this answers the question, but these are bad agents and there are more than one. So it's a multi-agent system. Okay, so if they evolve along with the good ones, I guess. That's almost unescapable then. Well, you know, it really depends who, who do you want to have, right? And uh, what what is it that you... Um, cater for well you know it depends really on on what your 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 overall dynamics is a society that 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 does penalize bad behavior will probably get better behavior on the long run right so now i i'll call our next discussion on the screen that would be oh yes and uh Walter, sorry Walter should actually come on screen at some point and say how his name is correctly pronounced but um, let's go to the next question. Uh, so I'm just inviting Garji. See whether that's working. This is the sensor question. Can you comment on so, the yes. uh, You can special. certainly start reading it. It's... Can you comment on the generalization to the specialization aspect of the sensors, right? That's the question? Right. Um, oh, he cannot right. see the invite again. So let me try this again. Reprompt. Right. Um, so basically, the question is uh, if I understand it correctly, you're asking they have sensors, but they can't. They can hardly act. Well, I don't think that the sensors are relevant. Otherwise, they would not need them. Okay? So whatever they adapt to is something they need to be able to sense. Unless it's automatic. Okay? You don't need a sensor necessarily if you react automatically to something because or it's too fast to react. So, for example, you can have a, um, a mechanics that makes your, your, your sensor just work the right way. Um, if I if I remember correctly, uh, I, I would have to read it up again. But there's a, a, there's a special parasitic fly that has evolved a basically mechanical link between the two eardrums. It doesn't have flies don't have eardrums, but this fly is able to hear um, crickets basically that they parasite, and they have an extremely high resolution in, in the directionality, and that's achieved by basically mechanical link, as far as I understand. Now, that's not, this mechanical link is just a mechanical link. There's no processing in there. But this mechanical link makes, uh, um, does the work necessary to uh, measure the time differences between the two ears to identify where, where, the, where the target, where the prey is, where the host is. Um, so I would say it doesn't have to be always an active sensor, right? But I, it has to have some function doesn't have a function at all it loses it so my my uh, my favorite example here is is, is a cave fish you have a cave fish they are blind um, there's no light so and the, that's it they have to live in the dark and they don't need the eyes and basically the eyes are just remnants they are still there but they don't do anything 
There's another solution, of course, that uh, deep sea fish have developed. Deep sea fish, of course, instead of throwing away the possibility to see, they use bacteria, light-producing bacteria, to generate light, so the eyes are still useful. Now, of course, I, th I think the, the deep sea fish have a much better chance of doing that because their environment is much, much bigger. So they have the chance of finding such bacteria. The cave fish don't have that luxury. So the cave fish is simply adapted to a world that's more uh, impoverished. Okay, I think actually we're now actually getting Garvey on screen. So hang on a second and um, maybe, oh, there you are. Hello. Yeah. I don't know whether I answered the question though. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that also would, uh, like the deep sea example that you gave, uh, I understand they would over time have uh, features that have evolved to make them suitably compatible to it. I don't know whether that's like evolution of a feature or maybe we can call it specialization. But my point was like when it emerges, as we have read, like it's a chance factor and then it gets selected over a particular point of time. So when it is emerging, it is cost effective. but for a particular duration in future it is ultimately being beneficial so my point was even if it is not beneficial for a short period of time it is getting selected so how is it like in that sense excellent question excellent question excellent question um the i do think that you need a gradient for evolution to work it doesn't have to be very large but it has to be there um, but the, the gradient does not have to be a direct viability measure. Mm -hmm. In fact, I didn't talk about that because I didn't have the time. But there is a section uh, that I sometimes present in my talks about why information may sometimes drive sensors to become increasingly capable mm -hmm. without actually an external evolutionary pressure to do so. And there is a this is a longer story, so I can't I can't really give a short answer here. And unfortunately, we don't we can't socialize with, at the coffee table and and, and discuss this. But essentially, the, the idea is, um, or the, the the hypothesis is, and it's not proven. And I, to be honest, I would not know how how to prove this hypothesis at this stage. Uh, maybe there's a way of of running a long term experiment. No no idea. But the idea is the following: when you take in sensory information and turn it into action, so relevant information. It turns out that there is an inefficiency. This is inefficiency is well known to people who do information theory. So this inefficiency means not all information that you take in is converted into actionable information. Right. The relevant information may be much lower than information you need to process in the first stage. It's this, what, what, even without feedback, Zhao Ping talked yesterday about feedback, but even without feedback, there's a, a huge inefficiency between what you need to take in and, and extract information from and what you need to act upon. This, in, in, this can be predicted from information bottleneck theory. So if you do information bottlenecks, the information, the mutual information between the target variable and the image variable, that's what you want to have. Mm -hmm. And the information from image variable to bottleneck variable, that latter information is usually much higher. So what I think, and this is a pure hypothesis at this stage, uh, as I say, I, I, can't, I, I can't imagine an experiment how to prove that. Uh, it's not that we couldn't prove it and we couldn't run evolution, but it's simply not feasible at this stage, is that if you have this incredible amount of information that you have to process, but you use only one bit, say, right. then right. evolution at, evolution favors behaviors that make use of the extra bits. Mm. There are extra bits. Mm. And these bits can be used. There are more targets you can do. You can do targets more flexible. You can do acceptation. You can basically adapt your sensor to some other niche without extra cost. You don't pay. You don't lose anything by doing so. The, 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 you wander the niche without actually making a trade-off. Exactly. Yeah, you become, exactly. you're still as, as near optimal as you were before. Hmm. So basically like this, this, uh, uh, this, this uh, surface is oiled, well oiled. 
Great. And this is information theoretic property. The model, if you want, is in a paper by Van Dyke and myself, 2012. Uh, so I, I can, I can, uh, Van Dyke. It's about sensor evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's in the in the in the chat. Thank you. This, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and and basically the prediction is that either you move along this uh, this this parallel uh, this this uh, um, set of possibilities to a different sensor or you refine the existing sensor very quickly. So you get very quickly, as you add abilities, you refine it extremely quickly to maximum or near maximum resolution. Right. Just informational pressures, no viability pressure. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. Okay. And uh, if I made the second question was like animals which have very negligible action, like I give the example of tardigrades, they hardly move at all. So how do they, uh, like how are they influencing the environment in changing the environment? Well, they influence them by moving. I mean, they move, if they can move, there's some advantage to be able to move, right? So um, there are bacteria, for example, uh, that or the archaea. I, I forgot the name of the species, but there's an archaeum that when everything's fine, it's just floating around. Mm -hmm. And when they you, you make them hungry, you take away the nutrients from the environment, they sprout they sprout uh, a flagella and start start moving around. Right, right. So in other words, if everything is fine, why why bother, right? If everything's fine, just sit in front of the TV, watch and, and eat chips. Right, uh, but but you know when when uh, suddenly you don't have any chips anymore and the coke and the pizza is finished, then you have to do something. You have to run out and get a pizza or your, your, your crisps or whatever. So essentially, if you're not stressed, why bother? I mean that is some quite a normal state. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but but I would say of course you can't just sprout sensors out of nothing in general, and that's why they have to be there. So the question is always a trade-off. Having a sensor, using it, and note that fast sensors usually correlate with fast actuators. Mm -hmm. So let's take mollusks. If you have a snail, they have some eyes. They move not very fast. Um, yeah, they're, they're moving faster than some 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 drivers on the road, but but still, right? And then there's of course octopuses, who have eyes that are macroanatomically actually surprisingly similar to uh, mammal eyes, and uh, uh, <laughs> I like that uh, yeah, COVID the comes along. The chat, yeah. the chat is developing life of its own here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see, I see. Um, so, so, so basically, in mollusks, you can see that very nicely. So I would es estimate that there is a relation between the speed of actuators and the speed uh, and um, fine fine grainness of sensors. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank you. much, Gary, for your questions. Okay, now we'll uh, look at a virtual person to join us. We'll see who that is. Virtual Mario is coming on. Good name. But but they have to make some jumps first. <laughs> right. Well, it looks like two, at least two hemispheres to virtual Mario, left and right. And yes, so they have to find the key, open the door. <laughs> and now comes the boss fight. Well, welcome to the screen. And uh... yeah, so yeah, thank you for yeah for the nice talk and all the interesting uh, answers as well. It was uh, very motivating. So I'm interested in, on on the on your comment uh, during the talk about the cost of of energy processing. Um, and at least, for example, in humans, we know that the consumption of information is relatively constant, and then around eighty percent of the energy that is consuming consumed in 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 the central nervous systems is consumed at the synapse, therefore at the integration level. So, if, for example, during the sleep this doesn't change either, how can we reconcile the continuous consumption of energy? with the extra cost that information processing might impose on, on the system. Yeah, I, let, let, let's distinguish the things. There was a question about the 20 and 40%. I must confess that I used to talk always about 20%. And then somebody 
pointed out in the paper that that was 40% or 50%. I, I obviously slightly uncritically uh, took over this uh, this uh, um, this number. So uh, here somebody mentioned that it's actually coming up from um, the children actually have the highest consumption of energy. So I could not reconstruct which paper actually um, claims this 40, 50 percent uh, by activity. So I will treat this statement with care. I will, for now, I would say, put it in the quarantine, right? I mean, maybe it's true, maybe it's a correct statement, but I, uh, the, the paper needs to be identified. Uh, definitely it seems to be, there seem to be differences over the developmental uh, period of yeah. That's the first thing. The second thing about use of information, I would say the way I look at it, and it's a model, it's, it's not claiming to be correct, is essentially, basically attention we know is a limited resource, right? So you, you can't have, you know, when you're on a mobile, um, having a role with, 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 with your friend, and and um, with your partner and you're driving this is not helping okay it's very clear that um information is separated and there is a limited pool in a way that you can use to process information uh in a, in a coherent way i mean the training can improve that that's exactly why uh, firefighters soldiers uh, doctors uh, practice a lot so you can devolve information processing um and if you can do but it takes a long time right so so you it takes a long time to get them to the point that they become so effective that it's automatic but yeah. normally you essentially spend you have to divide your conscious or your conscious attention to different tasks so i treat it as a pool of information processing from which you take out some and of course you want to minimize that you want you want not to spend more on this pool than you have to right if you if you can afford to use less um, then you do. Sometimes you make mistakes. Okay. So, but then, okay. Let's put let's put the the exact um, level of energy consumption on, on quarantine. I like this uh, statement. And but if we compare, for example, um, the now you are giving you are giving a, an example at a conscious uh, action and in a conscious state, but. This is also true regardless of how high the percentage the percentage is, regardless if you are asleep or if you are in a minimal and responsive state, like in, in comatose patients. So okay. at, this, at this level, and uh, the uh, the consumption remains relatively constant, and but the the information that is being processed towards the the sensor, of course, the it's, it's, it's different, so that's that's where I where I would like to, uh, you know, inquire you about about what will be your interpretation of, of this relatively constant consumption depending on the, regardless of the state of the system. So th basically, this is a question that actually needs to be asked of the biologist. So does the consumption change, and where does it change? When does it change? Are there different parts of the brain, where sometimes the consumption is constant, others is not. So um, I can't answer this because I'm not, uh, not a neuroscientist, uh, but this may be actually an interesting question for the future. Um, on the other hand, if you have an existing infrastructure, then this needs to be maintained, con con information or not, right? If you have a direct line to uh, the emergency services, and this needs to be maintained, and it, it can't be used for other information. This line has is used in an energy. That's it, right? The the, the informationally optimal. The, the big mistake that early information theorists did that treated Shannon Shannon's original model as sacrosanct. So we have more information. We have rare events, rare very rare events, and then it's log minus log p, and that's a that's a whole story. But we know it's much more complicated um, mm -hmm. than. The reality is that there is an architecture, and this architecture has is there. Once you were born, it's been set up, and once it's set up, uh, it uses the energy it needs to use. I don't know whether there are parts which can use less if they don't need uh, if they don't need information. That's something that I would actually ask the 
the neuroscientist community. That would be actually something I, I would be interested in knowing. And then the question is, what would distinguish these parts of the brain? Why would a one part use constantly the same amount of information, uh, energy, the other one not? Informationally, though, the story is clear, right? I mean, if I process information somehow, mm -hmm. then it has some role. I will not process this information if, if it has no role. If, and the, if the role is dreaming, that's fine. That's a role. It means dreaming is like an exercising yeah. exercise the model, like retraining your network, your generalizing, creating generalizations, creating new connections and things like that. So essentially, and I do, it's also well known that um, I just uh, see a little bit of the chat on the side. I do know that under stress, people can lose a lot of weight. I know a case of somebody under big stress. Uh, it's a very funny story, which I'll tell another story. It didn't happen directly to me, but somebody I know. Uh, but this is a story for for the for the after after dinner party. Um, somebody I know lost four kilograms in a day through a very stressful, Great. kind of positively stressful situation. Right? It was not a very bad situation, but it was stressful. And uh, yeah, so it, I have no idea whether this was lost by the body or the brain. Interesting question. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Abed's question. And uh, since uh, the hour is passing so quickly and we still have some questions, let's uh, thank you and invite Abed. It's an amazing conversation on the on the side, but I can't I can't follow it. Uh, so I... <laughs> OK, there we go. Yes, we all go multitasking when we do online work. Yeah, yeah this is uh, also attention, attention consuming. Hi. It's very pertinent. That's why I'm also um, following. Hi. Hi. So I wanted to ask about the relation between empowerment and autonomy. So if we say that the agent has reached a level of autonomy, meaning that it modeled the environment somehow, um, uh, can that be achieved by empowerment? Is empowerment a necessary condition or a sufficient condition of autonomy? Or... Excellent question. I would say, let's put it this way. Our working hypothesis is empowerment is actually a measure of autonomy. And in fact, an organism wants to maximize its autonomy in a way, right? Um, it looks quite consistent throughout, throughout uh, the experiments we've done in the last years that it's pretty closely correlated to what we humans would consider, yeah, this autonomy, this is what I would want to have, this freedom that I would like to have when I'm an agent in a, in a situation, right? So it, it is, well, synonymous in a way. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Right. It was an easy one. <laughs> So maybe I can uh, squeak in a question uh, since I'm so taken with the RoboCup uh, and these are agents that are, are, I guess are trying to employ all the rules and mastery of information that you're talking about and yet they're doing poorly. Uh, at least for many years they're doing poorly uh, So, so uh, compared to human players. So, so the question is, what is the challenge? Why, does it, why is it so hard to make a good soccer team with a multi-agent player? Hardware. Hardware. So if you look at the probably strongest uh, leagues, the strongest leagues are um, the 2D simulation league and the mid mid-size league. So the 2D simulation league are little little discs moving on 2Ds and kicking the ball so fast that essentially as a human, you would not have a shred of a chance against them. They will just smash you to bits, right? Um, they are very, very fast, super coordinated, and, and um, no human had a, a slight chance. So you would put a team of humans, they will not succeed. Um, what they would do, they would improve the game, but I think they will be smashed to bits. So it's clearly not the AI, but of course they're all handcrafted, okay? Most of it is handcrafted. The second one that's quite impressive is the mid-size league. The mid-size robots are as, you know, roughly half a meter high and they move quite fast. So they can make humans already run, give a run for the, I mean, humans can beat them if we, when we as amateurs or uh, beginners or dilettantes play against them, then we have a hard time and the professional team probably could still beat them. 
but they already look like they're planning, they're kicking balls up, they're hitting goals, and they're quite fast, and plus, they're careful not to run into humans. If they didn't take care of that, they probably the humans would have also a hard time, because they would be afraid of them. In fact, this will be also one of the big challenges in 2050, to have, if you have humanoid robots, that humans are actually ready to play against. Because, you know, these robots can easily break somebody's le leg or, or, or worse. So you want really robots that you're prepared to play against. Okay, they're dangerous, but not um, not too, um, how do you say, um, antagonistic, but not too antagonistic. This is what makes RoboCup so interesting. You have collaboration with your team, you have antagonism against the other team, but still you don't want to be cross the line, right? You don't really over antagonism. It's not, it's not war, right? And uh, therefore I would say it's, it's a nice model for that. But right now I would say the AI is a problem, but the hardware is a big problem. We underestimate how good our hardware is actually as, as uh, organisms. Our hardware is really good. We have extremely fine-tuned sensors, a lot of them distributed over the whole body. Um, they understand what's going on. We know to compensate. That's an interesting part. It's for, interesting for AI. Compensating. We are very good at compensating. Robots are not. Okay. This is something that maybe not more modern methods may solve. Um, brain is very good at compensating. It compensates even itself. We know that people who have strokes manage to circum sur surround sometimes some some defects, some some lesions of the brain, and and solve problems in a different ways. We don't know how to do that, but I think there we we approaching we approaching a, a, a vestige of understanding. So you're saying, so you're it's, not saying it's not strategy. It's not, it's not, it's not the head, the head, 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 head having one of the world, 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 just hardware and cloud. I think in anticipation and strategy, um, I would say in long-term strategy, uh, we are still better. Context switching, we are still much better. Um, anticipation, anticipation tactics, no. Uh, machines are better than us on that. But long-term strategy and uh, is context switching is something where we are um, we are um, very good and machines are very dumb. Context switching is the one, in my opinion, the one big challenge to AI is context switching. That's one thing that we know to know very well to do and machines don't. Okay, and then for the final okay, question, the final we are really, really kind of close, close out of time. Close, close out of time. Anand, had Anand had a question, and the co-moderator, he gets to finish the session. Thank you, Dad. Uh, am I audible? Uh, am I audible? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Polani, for the great talk. Uh, so my question was about so the uh, example you gave about the Bayesian network, uh, where the agent has to navigate the entire space, and then uh, after infinite time, the amount of information, the sensory information processed by the agent is almost equivalent to the entropy of the environment. Not of the environment. The original entropy that it needs to remove. OK, OK. Because so I, from, the, from the initial state to the center, it needs to remove entropy. And whatever it takes in over time okay. must approach this value. So I was just wondering, uh, just wondering uh, so, uh, so it's like annealing or say simulated annealing where that's another optimization problem. Uh, that's stochastic. So can that be viewed in this uh, framework? Because there's no information processing in simulated annealing, but still there is optimization. I mean, there's a navigation and then there's an optimization. But uh, there is no information processing. So in which one? Sir, in the example? Uh, the, sim uh, the simulated annealing. Uh, uh, simulated annealing. Right. Yeah, yeah. This is information processing. Every time you select, every time you say, I, I, I make this um, uh, lottery, this dice throw, and decide I take it or I don't, that's information selection. It's not very efficient, but it's information processing. I make a selection. I take it or I don't take it. And if you had, say, some, 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 you know, uh, imagine some poor undergrad gets paid for making this decision, it, it work. Yeah, you th they throw the die. Yeah, I'll take it. Throw the die. No, I don't take it. This, uh, there's this famous experiment, Buffon, 
did it uh, to estimate pi by by stochastic experiment, throwing a needle into a into a ring, and whenever it was, I don't know, I forgot the but essentially, yeah, this experiment over and over and over. People underestimate because when you can program, you this work is done by the computer, but it's information process. Actually, you can treat it as information processing. It's not very efficient, yes, but it's information processing. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Sorry about that. Sorry uh, about that. Uh, I have an echo now, so I, I muted myself. But um, uh, one hour and five minutes. I think we had a great conversation. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for answering. And we'll all think about information in new ways, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, I would love to spend a drink of beer. Thank you for yes, inviting yes. me. Definitely a drink Definitely would be drink nice. Would be uh, nice. Everyone, everyone have a drink on their own. own. And uh, uh, I guess we could get drunk from what it looks like, like, it, like it, uh, in the distraction. Thank you very much, much indeed. Okay. Bye.